On November 29, 1954, Joel Daniel Cohen was born in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, the son of Edward Cohen, a professor of economics at the University of Minnesota, and Rena Cohen, who was born Rena Newman, who was an art historian at St. Cloud State University. Ethan Jesse Cohen was born on September 21, 1957. Both sides of the Cohen family were Ashkenazi Jews. Edward, Edward Cohen was an American citizen born in the United States, but grew up in Croydon, London, and studied at the London School of Economics. Afterwards, he moved to the United States, where he met the Cohen's mother and served in the Army during World War II. The Cohen's developed an early interest in cinema through television. They grew up watching Italian films aired on a Minneapolis station, and also the Tarzan films and comedies. In the mid-1960s, Joel saved money from mowing lawns to buy a Vivitar Super 8 camera. Together, the brothers remade movies they saw on television with their neighborhood friend Mark Zimmering as the star. Joel and Ethan graduated from St. Louis Park High School in 1973 and 1976, respectively. They both graduated from Bard College at Simons Rock in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. After Simons Rock, Joel spent four years in the undergraduate film program at New York University, where he made a 30-minute thesis film called Soundings. In 1979, he briefly enrolled in the graduate film program at the University of Texas at Austin, following a woman he had married who was in the graduate linguistics program. The marriage soon ended in divorce, and Joel left University of Texas Austin after nine months. In the meantime, Ethan went on to Princeton University and earned an undergraduate degree in philosophy in 1979. After graduating from NYU, Joel worked as a production assistant on a variety of industrial films and music videos. He developed a talent for film editing and met Sam Rami while assisting Edna Ruth Paul in editing Rami's first feature film, The Evil Dead, released in 1981. In 1984, the brothers wrote and directed Blood Simple, their first commercial film together. The film starred Francis McDormand, who went on to feature in many of the Coen's brothers' films and also marry Joel. Their next film was Crime Wave, released in 1985, followed by Raising Arizona, released in 1987, starring Nicolas Cage and Holly Hunter. Miller's Crossing, released in 1990, was a film about feuding gangsters and starred Albert Finney, Gabriel Byrne, and John Turturro. Uh, the following year, they released Barton Fink, a movie starring John Turturro and co-starring John Goodman. Barton Fink was a critical success, earning Oscar nominations and also winning the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. Hudsucker Proxy, co-written with Rami, was released in 1994 about a large corporation who appoints a patsy, uh, played by Tim Robbins, for underhanded reasons. Um, the film bobbed at the box office even though it featured Paul Newman and Jennifer Jason Lee. Uh, the Collins wrote and directed their next movie, Fargo, released in 1996, in their home state of Minnesota. Produced on a budget of $7 million, the film was a critical and commercial success. The film received several awards, including a BAFTA Award, a Cannes Award for Direction, and two Oscars, a Best Original Screenplay, and Best Actress Oscar for McDormand. Uh, the Coen's next film was The Big Lebowski, released in 1998, starring Jeff Bridges, Steve Buscemi, and John Goodman. I bought this DVD for $4.99 on Amazon, uh, but it was back ordered for about three weeks. But I thought it was well worth it for the price, which by the way, is well below the qualifying price of less than or equal to $13.91. So it was a pretty good deal. Dude here. The dude's been 
hired to deliver a million dollar ransom. Her life is in your hands, dude. And now he's lost it. You got any leads? Leads. <laughs> Jeff Bridges. Life goes on, man. Ow! John Goodman. Because the whole world's gone crazy! Julianne Moore from the creators of Fargo. Where's the money, Lebowski? The Big Lebowski. It's down there somewhere. Let me take another look. Rated R. Opens Friday at theaters everywhere. In 1991, out-of-work slacker and bowler Jeffrey the Dude Lebowski is attacked in his Los Angeles home by two enforcers for porn kingpin Jackie Treehorn, to whom a different Jeffrey Lebowski's wife owes money. One of the thugs urinates on the dude's rug before the two realize that they have the wrong man and leave. The dude consults his bowling partners, Walter Sobchak, played by John Goodman, and Donnie Kerbatsos, uh, Steve Buscemi, and Walter advises that he seek the rich Lebowski for compensation for his peed rug, as it was his wife who owes money. Uh, he visits wealthy philanthropist Jeffrey Lebowski, played by David Huddleston, requesting compensation for the urinadon rug. Uh, Lebowski refuses, blaming everyone but himself, but the dude tricks his assistant Brant uh, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman into letting him take a similar rug from the mansion. Outside, the dude meets Bunny, played by Tara Reed, who is Lebowski's trophy wife, and her German nihilist friend, Yuli. Uh, as the dude celebrates his victory with his bowling buddies, uh, Bunny is apparently kidnapped, and Lebowski hires the dude to deliver the requested ransom money, which amounts to one million dollars. He is to be paid $20,000 to act as a courier. That night, another group of thugs ambushed the dude, taking his replacement rug on behalf of Lebowski's daughter, Maud, played by Julian Moore, who has a sentimental attachment to it. The kidnappers arranged to collect the ransom. Uh, Walter is convinced that the kidnapping wasn't real, and thus plots to keep the money for the dude and himself, substituting it with a bag of dirty laundry. Kidnappers leave with Walter's bag, and he and the dude return to the bowling alley, leaving the briefcase of money in the dude's car trunk. While they bowl, the car, including the briefcase, is stolen. Uh, the dude is soon confronted by Lebowski and Brandt. Uh, Lebowski hands him an envelope with a severed toe, supposedly Bunny's. Uh, Maud meets with the dude and asks him to help recover the money, which his father in Belgium from the family's charity foundation. The dude receives a phone call from the police who tell him that his car has been found and taken to an impound lot. He notices that the briefcase is missing, but he drops a lit cigarette. While trying to put it out, he finds a piece of homework belonging to a teenager named Larry Sellers. Walter and the dude drive to Larry's house and interrogate him, but are unable to get any information out of him. Walter smashes a brand new sports car he thinks Larry purchased with the stolen money, but he attracts the attention of the car's real owner, who just, uh, destroys the dude's car in retaliation. Uh, the dude is then abducted by Jackie Treehorn's uh, henchman and taken to see Treehorn, a porn kingpin. The dude tells Treehorn that Bunny faked her kidnapping and that the ransom money is with Larry Sellers. The dude passes out after drinking a spiked white Russian given to him by Treehorn. He has an elaborate dream in which he sees Saddam Hussein running the bowling shoe concession and also a 1930s style music number in which Maud is dressed like a Viking, uh, but also the Neos chase him and threaten to cut off his penis. Um, while the dude awakens, uh, he's arrested by the Malibu police. They release him, telling him to stay out of Malibu. As the ta a taxi drives him home, he criticizes the drivers listening to the Eagles, and as a result, the driver kicks him out of his taxi. Forced to walk home, he's passed by Bunny, who is revealed to have both toes intact. Um, it is revealed later that uh, the several, severed toe came from the girlfriend of one of the Nihilists. Uh, returning home, the dude finds his apartment trashed by Jackie Treehorn's thugs, and also finds Maud, who has sex with him. She explains that she is trying to become pregnant by a father 
with whom she will not have to interact socially, and that her father has no money of his own, and his wealth came from her late mother. Leaving the apartment, the dude intercepts a private investigator who is trying to find Bunny, who ran away from the family farm in Minnesota. He also meets up with Walter and says that he doesn't think that the briefcase ever contained the ransom money and that Lebowski embezzled the funds himself. The dude and Walter go to Lebowski's house where they discover money has returned. They confront him uh, over the missing money, uh, but he claims he entrusted the ransom money to them and they took it. Walter claims Lebowski's paralysis is fake and he throws Lebowski out of his wheelchair only to find out that Lebowski's paralysis is real. At the bowling alley, they're confronted by Jesus, played by John Tuturu, who claims that Walter's adherence to the Sabbath is bogus. As they leave the bowling alley, the dude, Walter, and Donnie are confronted by the Nihilists, who have set fire to the dude's car. They demand the ransom money, even though they don't have a hostage. Walter easily fights them off, but during the altercation, Donnie dies of a heart attack. The dude and Walter argue with the Undertaker, who wants them to pay $180 for an urn, but Walter uses a coffee can. Walter scatters Donnie's ashes over, from a cliff overlooking uh, the Pacific Ocean, but they are blown back over uh, the two by an updraft. At the alley, the dude encounters the stranger, played by Sam Elliott, who sums up everything that's happened in the movie. He also reveals that Maud is pregnant with the dude's child. The Big Lebowski is an interesting movie. It was only a moderate box office success, making uh, $46.7 million on a budget of $15 million. It met with mixed reviews and did not get any Oscar nominations, although it did win several awards and has turned into a cult classic. And it even spawned a spin-off, The Jesus Rolls, released in 2020, in which John Turturro reprises his role as Jesus Quintana, I can say Jesus, not Jesus, I say Jesus, uh, although no other character from the movie was featured in this film. The storyline of the movie is somewhat odd. The movie ends where it began with the laid-back Lebowski bowling. Walter schemed to enrich himself by taking the ransom money, uh, but this plan failed because either the ransom money has been stolen or Lebowski embezzled the money and didn't give it to them in the first place. Um, either way, they didn't get the money and they end up the movie as poor as when the movie started. Bunny Lebowski has returned to her husband. The only difference is that Donnie has died, so they don't have a fall guy uh, who they can tell to shut up. Uh, if there's a moral to this story, it is not to live like these people because, like the nihilists they confront at the end of the movie, they live entirely in the present. Unambitious people, people looking for the easy buck but nothing to write home about. Um, this movie is essentially a historical fiction, uh, taking place in the early 1990s in the middle of the First Iraq War. Um, while some critics are puzzled by this, um, I think I kind of understand it now. The dude is essentially a product of the 1960s, a laid-back person wearing shorts and a robe. The world has left him behind, what with the Reagan era and 1980s prosperity turning hippies into yuppies faster than you can say Max Headroom. He clings to his laid-back dudeness while his friend Walter's in staple with, with the times, a stereotypical average American, belligerent, and uncompromising. Um, so, if you'll indulge me, I, th I still remember the historical context of the first Iraq War, and this has some relevance to the movie, just, just bear with me here. Um, Iraq had essentially wrapped up their war with Iran in August of 1988, and the United States under the Reagan administration supported them as, as a, a, a client state. Um, Iraq was essentially broke after the war. Uh, well, um, the pr price of a barrel of oil fell to like $10, and that kind of left them. Because their oil was their principal resource, so they're kind of broke. Uh, and Saddam Hussein, President and Prime Minister of Iraq, had a grievance with Kuwait. 
who claimed that uh, who claimed was slant drilling into Iraq. Hussein also had irredentist claims with Kuwait, which he said was always part of Iraq. Um, my understanding, and this is again, this is just my my opinion. Uh, you can because I don't really have time to check the facts, and if you want to check the facts, you can do it yourself. But my understanding was that uh, April uh, Glassby, the U.S. ambassador to Iraq, was cognizant of the dispute and told the Iraqi government that the Uni United States did not have an opinion on this dispute. Hussein knew about this and, and decided to invade Kuwait. And they, they thought that he was, he was going to invade the territories where the drilling was taking place. He didn't expect, the United States didn't expect uh, Hussein to invade the entire country. Um, so, yeah, once Iraq invaded Kuwait, apparently the United States did have an, option, an opinion on this dispute. Uh, the Bush administration was basking in the glow of unprecedented foreign policy success. It had taken office in January of 1989, and in June of that year, Poland had democratic elections, and uh, the Communist Party had been trounced. In September, there were protests across East Germany, and in early November, uh, the Berlin Wall was being taken down. One by one, communist regimes were collapsing over all over Eastern Europe, as these countries, for the most part, adopted democratic rule. Uh, in the meantime, Soviet republics were demanding increasing autonomy from the Soviet Union, with Lithuania declaring independence in um, March of 1990. So the cracks in the facade of the, of, of the Soviet Union were beginning to show. Um, the United States, which was in diplomatic, which was diplomatically and militarily in retreat since the fall of Saigon, had essentially completed the Reagan redemption arc and essentially complete the, the um, they're, they're very close to winning the Cold War, which would happen with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December of 1991. In this context, it was not surprising that the Bush administration, having ascended to an unprecedented level of power, and having as not a Great Britain, and this is important because while the United States didn't have a lot to lose, Great Britain did, um, they had vast oil investments in Kuwait, and uh, Kuwait was actually part of the British Empire until 1961, then it was independent, and, but they still had uh, investments in, in Kuwait, um, and apparently like Margaret Thatcher was putting pressure on, on Bush to do something. So yeah, not surprising that uh, the Bush administration would put pressure on Iraq to evacuate from Kuwait. And initially, Hussein, who essentially misread um, U.S. motives and objectives, wanted to withdraw. Um, he was just looking for a way to save face, whether it was to have an independent tribunal to resolve drilling disputes, or maybe standing up for Palestinian rights. But the Bush administration did not want to compromise and prepared for war. As you probably know, the United States won the first Iraq war. Hussein would survive, withstanding a Shiite and Kurd, Kurdish uprising and a revolt from his own military. He would be essentially an emasculated dictator with no fly zones or parts of his country and crippled with sanctions which would inflict one million casualties on the children of Iraq. And I tend to think that, that this is part, part of the downfall of the United States. Um, because everything that happened, happened because of, of uh, the first Iraq war. Um, the uh, United States had troops in Saudi Arabia, and that was one of the grievances that uh, Osama bin Laden had with the United States. Um, so, because of this, you have the September 11th attack. I mean, they may, they may have attacked anyway because, because of, of their... Uh, because of their intervention in uh, Afghanistan, but the September 11th attacks on the United States happened, the subsequent Afghan and Iraq wars, and the corresponding loss of influence on the Middle East was a result of this initial uncompromising nature. Um, and so instead of pursuing the war, the United States could have negotiated their way out of this conflict. They could have gotten Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait without firing a shot. Ultimately, the one 
the initial war, which was kind of deleterious to them, um, deleterious to, to the country in the long run. Um, similarly, Walter has drunk the Kool-Aid of drawing a line in the sand and is uncompromising, telling the dude that he should seek restitution for his urinated on rug. If he just, only just left it left well enough alone, he would only have a pea stained rug. He could have shampooed the rug himself. Um, but he is friendless with Walter, so he's condemned to having his car smashed and ultimately burned, being beat up and kidnapped, and being blamed for taking the ransom money. Oh, and Donnie is dead too. Um, also, the character of Jeffrey Lebowski, uh, known as the Big Lebowski, is, needless to say, interesting. He basically seems to see himself as an embodiment of Reagan's America, a self-made businessman who spends his declining years working in a charity for underprivileged youth. He even has a picture of himself with the First Lady. As his assistant Grant explains, there wasn't enough time for a photo op with President Reagan. So he's seen as like being an embodiment of Reagan's American, somebody who, who uh, gets his photo uh, he could, like basically like, like interact with Reagan. Um, yet this is basically a sham. Um, as Maud explains, all the wealth came from her late mother. They allowed Lebowski to run one of their companies for a period of time, but it was a dismal failure. Having been raised by such parents, it's not surprising that she grew up the way she did. In her world, the men are not providers, but are blood-sucking leeches, and they're little more than sperm factories, which is why she hooks up with the dude, if only temporarily. Um, that's basically my excuse for coming up with some semblance of meaning in this movie, which goes along with a more or less a meaningless plot. But the principal actors, uh, um, for example, uh, Jeff Bridges, uh, John Goodman, and Steve Buscemi, tie it together, along with Sam Elliott as a stranger. I think this is one of the strengths of this movie, in that it doesn't have an obvious message. The viewer has to search for meaning here. Um, one of the reviews of this movie claims that it can be viewed multiple times and the, the viewer can see things that didn't make an impression the first time and it's very quotable. There's something to that. Um, so, yeah, it has a very episodic uh, format to it like, where um, things are isolated to like, one scene um, and the scenes are pretty amazing, but they're really the, 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 there's no real, real real plot connecting them together. Um, if, a filmmaker, if a filmmaker wants to make a cult classic, they might watch The Big Lebowski, because in many ways, the Coen brothers have distilled the essence of what makes a film a cult classic, and the screenplay here is simply an execution of this formula. In conclusion, I find this movie, although it doesn't have really much of a plot, is enjoyable to watch, and the viewer could find meaning that makes sense for him him or her. The acting is very good, and overall, I give this movie a 9 out of 10. Oh, by the way, the directing is, is excellent, too. Anyway, 9 out of 10. I wanted to say, make some brief remarks about the rating of this movie. This movie is rated R for pervasive strong language, drug content, sexuality, which means nudity, and brief violence. So... Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, rated R for good reasons, yet I felt that, that, that the, the uh, foul language, drug content, sexuality, and brief violence were not gratuitous, so it, it was basically justified in this movie. Unlike the previous movie, Semi-Pro, where I, th where I thought the, uh, the, the foul language was, was uh, gratuitous, um, it's not in this movie. So uh, yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to take your kids to see uh, an R-rated movie, but uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a good movie. There are some bonus materials on this disc. There's a montage of Jeff Bridges' photography, uh, which are stills taken on the set of the movie, a 24-minute movie on the making of The Big Lebowski, and also some production notes. The movie can be heard in English and dubbed in French in uh, 5.1 surround sound uh, and is dubbed into Spanish but only in stereo. 
Um, you can enable subtitles in English, Spanish, and French. There's also a scene selection, but there's no directors and or actors commentary, which was a little disappointing. But overall, there's a lot of bonus materials, which should keep the average uh, Big Lebowski fan occupied. So uh, overall, I, I was impressed with the bonus materials on this disc. The Big Lebowski is a good movie, with solid acting, a somewhat meaningless plot, but with well-crafted scenes that the viewer can interpret to give the storyline meaning, or not at all if the viewer doesn't want to. Uh, the DVD extras provide enough value, and even the lack of a commentary track doesn't influence my positive view of this DVD. And it's only $4.99, which means that it qualifies, it well qualifies for a low-budget review. Overall, I highly recommend this movie. Uh, that's it for this DVD review. I'm still thinking about the movie I'm going to do for next week's uh, review. Um, it may be a movie from the Will Ferrell 3 movie collection. Um, but I don't really... Oh yeah, and I I know it's like the Coen Brothers also uh, directed uh, Fargo, which uh, is kind of an interesting movie. Um, it was a movie and it was made into a TV series. Uh, uh, but yes, yeah, I, I should probably remove the, review the movie, but I'm not sure if I'm going to do that next week. Um, so like the video and comment on it, and hit the subscribe button to be informed of the latest low-budget review. As always, thanks for watching.